everybody, so welcome back. I hope you had a good night and a good breakfast and everything. And uh, so it's time for uh, starting with Pasquale's next to last question. First Pasquale, Pasquale B. Uh, so I leave the room to him. Get me the paper back. For those of you who left the USB key here and didn't hear me that I said it's here, I don't know where they are. I will ask to the cleaning person if they found a few of them this morning. But I believe it was just few because most of the people came to pick them up. Okay, I'll try and I'll do my best. Pasquale. Okay, so uh, yesterday we got to a very important uh, uh, point in the lectures. We showed that using the equations that we had derived for conservation of mass, momentum, and energy in the first uh, uh, few other classes, we derived that in addition to the in addition to the trivial solution of the fluid equ uh, uh, equations in which there is no nothing interesting happening, everything is constant. We also found that there is a non-trivial solution which has a discontinuity uh, inside, and we also derived what are known as the jump conditions at this surface, the jump conditions at this shock surface. Also, I told you yesterday that this shock structure that is formed is quite unlike any other kind of shocks that you find in uh, our everyday life. Uh, I made the example of the airplane, military airplanes uh, with Mach number about 1.5 or 2 or so. In many respects, first of all, the role of collisions. So in the atmosphere, you have collisions. Here, you don't have collisions. That's why they are called collisionless shock waves. Uh, another quantitative um, uh, difference is that the Mach numbers that we will be talking about here are of the order of 1,000. Okay, and this you can see very uh, easily. For instance, try to take the energy that yesterday we were talking about for supernovae, for instance, 10 to 51 ergs. Try to put that in uh, a few solar masses, say one solar mass of material. Everything is non-relativistic. One, one half of mv squared equals 10 to 51 ergs. You will find uh, 10,000 kilometers per second. And then you use the expression we wrote down here yesterday for the speed of sound, square root of gamma p over rho, right? And you take rho equal to n m p k t, okay? Uh, and the game is finished. You calculate what's the sound speed, it's 10 kilometers per second. So 10,000 over 10, you have a Mach number of 1,000, okay? So clearly, these are extremely strong shocks. And you remember yesterday we always, um, uh, made the limit of strong shocks, we assumed M1 much larger than unity for this reason, because most of the cases of interest have Mach number which wildly exceed uh, unity. So that approximation is a good one. Within this approximation, as we saw yesterday, there are some simplified jump conditions. So let's specify a little bit of formalism. Let's assume that everything is happening along some z-axis. So the shock is somewhere here. Since we have colors, let's use them. So the shock is here, and it's at uh, z equals zero. If you are sitting in the reference frame of the discontinuity of the shock, this uh, region here for z less than zero, so from minus infinity, from minus infinity in, it's called the upstream of the shock. So in other words, if you're sitting on the reference frame of a supernova shock, this guy here is the interstellar medium that is coming towards you. If you're sitting in the reference frame of the shock, this part here is where the supernova is. Okay, so when the supernova exploded, the supernova is down there, and the shock is expanding this way, but if you're sitting in the reference frame of the shock, is the ISM that is coming towards you. And we will call U1 the velocity of the shock there, of the plasma in this region. In the same reference frame, the velocity of the uh, plasma in the downstream is some U2. And you remember yesterday, we saw that the compression factor is defined as U1 over U2, or rho2 over rho1, and in the limit of Mach number much larger than 1, this reduces to four, okay? With, for an ideal monatomic gas with gamma equal five thirds. So this is the kind of setup 
that we want to uh, consider today. So first of all, let's uh, very quickly repeat the exercise that we have done yesterday, and I quoted that exercise as the original idea of Fermi. With, you remember with the clouds of magnetic field moving at random, okay? Now, what we will be discussing today is usually called in the literature first order Fermi acceleration. Fermi didn't have anything to do with this idea. It was developed in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. So no connection, with the, Fermi was dead in 1955. So it had no con, he had no connection with this. But uh, the sort of line of reasoning is similar. And so people honored the mechanism with his name. But formally speaking, it is not directly associated with him. So one uh, qualitative consideration, first of all. Now, the relative velocity between this one and this one here, between the two sides of the shock, of course, is u1 minus u2. So just to think a little bit about what this means. u2 is one fourth of u1, so it's less. So if you are sitting on the, let's move reference frame. So let's say that instead of the shock, now you are sitting on the downstream. Hmm? In which direction, with respect to you, is this gas moving? You know it. Share it with me. <laughs> this way. Now jump on the other side and sit on this plasma. In which direction is this mo gas moving? This side. So interestingly, you invented a system in which from whatever side you are, it always looks like the other side is moving towards you. This is, qualitatively speaking, the reason why uh, you remember yesterday I told you that the second order, with all those clouds, is second order because there are configurations that lead to energy increase or energy decrease. In this analogy, in this problem, there are only two clouds, and the two clouds are the upstream and the downstream. But they are always moving in the direction opposite to the direction from which the particle is coming. And if you remember yesterday I told you that the configurations that lead to energy enhancement are the ones in which the particle in the cloud are uh, head on. So this is exactly that kind of situation. So in order to uh, understand this in a more um, uh, quantitative way, let's say that uh, you have a particle with energy E, for instance upstream, it doesn't matter where you start from, but let's say that you inject this particle uh, in, the, in the upstream. Um, and uh, what you want to do is to calculate the energy that it would have in the downstream once it goes in there, okay? So from the point of view of the downstream observer. So if you start from E, the energy in the downstream can be just derived by usual Lorentz transformation. So it's a gamma E times uh, one plus beta, the cosine of the pitch angle, where gamma and beta now are Beta is one, U1 minus U2 over C, and gamma is the Lorentz factor corresponding to that. Of course, it's all non-relativistic, but let's retain the beta and gamma. And moreover, uh, mu in, in this uh, uh, problem, you see the particle is being injected here, and it's going here, right? So the mu is forced to be between zero and one, right? So for this to be true, mu must be zero or uh, between zero and one, because this is this angle, right? And of course, if you want the particle to go that way, you are forced to assume that mu is between zero and one. Now, Pasquale told you that particles uh, diffuse in the presence of the in, uh, of fluctuations in the field, right? So the alpha n waves that we discussed many times. So if the particles are actually diffusing in the upstream and they are diffusing in the downstream, there is a finite probability that we will calculate in a second that a particle actually goes back to the shock again, right? And once it does so, once it goes back to the shock, uh, what happens is that the final energy, e, let's call it e upstream again, okay? So you start with this, particle goes downstream, and eventually goes back uh, upstream. This guy here is simply gamma squared times C, 
1 plus beta mu times 1 minus beta mu prime, where mu prime, however, now, again, these are particles that this time they're going this way, right? Because they are forced to go on the other side. Therefore, mu prime must be between minus 1 and 0. And now look at the amazing thing that has happened. This is all the physics. All the rest is a lot of math, but you see, all the physics has already happened here because the, the, the initial energy is connected to ED times this thing, through this thing, but mu is positive, so this is positive. And then the further step is mu prime between minus one and one, so this is positive. So the final energy got to be larger than the initial one. There is not any configuration that leads to energy decrease. All of a sudden, you invent a system for which uh, there are no configurations that lead to energy decrease. Therefore, the system, as we will show in a second, becomes first order in the quantity beta, which is uh, u1 minus u2 over c. The other thing that happens is that the uh, order parameter that was uh, va over c in the case of the exercise with uh, clouds a la Fermi now becomes this beta, which is u1 minus u2 over c, and I told you that u is of order 10,000 kilometers per second, not 10 kilometers per second. So you have two effects at the same time that work in the uh, right direction. Well, there is another thing that we need to do, exactly the same thing that we did yesterday for the case of, um, uh, of the clouds, namely calculating the probability, uh, the probability that upstream or downstream the particle is moving with a uh, pitch angle mu or mu prime on the other side. It's the calculation is the same. Um, uh, okay, so what I have is that the current through the surface is the integral in the solid angle of n over 4 pi, where n is the, the number of particles which are sitting at the shock, and I'm assuming that they are isotropized through diffusion. So diffusion leads the particles to roughly go in the same direction and with the same probability in all uh, directions. And then I have to multiply by the velocity in the velocity component in the z direction, which of course is v mu, okay? And uh, this object here, you see it's uh, this n over four uh, pi. Well, in the end we will assume here that uh, uh, we will assume that the velocity v is close to the velocity of light. So in the end, this guy here, just do the, the integral, and it's nv over fourth. So at this point, if you write the p mu as uh, p mu, the probability of having a particle is moving between mu and mu plus d mu is some a n v mu, which is the flux of particles going in that uh, direction, divided by the total one, which is nv over uh, 4. And you, of course, you want this uh, to be, um, uh, you want this to be uh, normalized to unity. And this leads to the constant a. Uh, so this guy here is uh, p mu d mu equal to 2 mu. So the p mu correctly normalized is this guy here. And it's simply not obtained by assuming that the p mu that derived from here uh, is such that the integral in d mu between uh, 0 and 1 is equal, or p mu is equal to 1. OK? You can repeat exactly the same exercise on the other side, so in, for the particles that are going the other way. And you get the same thing with the minus sign, of course, because mu is negative there. Right? So you know the probability on one side, and you know the probability on the other side. Well, at this point, the exercise is really simple, because I have uh, EU from here, which is the final energy, in a sense, right? So it's after one cycle. So I have EU, and I have the initial energy, which is E, and I want to calculate this delta E over E, and I want to get the number which doesn't depend on mu anymore. So I want to average over uh, mu. Averaging over mu means that I have to do an integral in d mu and integral 
on uh, mu prime, this is between zero and one, this is minus one, zero, of what? Well, I have p mu and p mu prime, which are these guys here, with a minus sign because it's a probability, so it has to be positive, okay? And then simply the delta E over E, which I calculated by doing this minus the initial one divided uh, by the initial one. And that guy is gamma square one plus beta mu, one minus beta mu prime minus one. Okay, this is uh, an integral in just mu and mu prime, so it's really a uh, silly integral. And this is right? So what happened here is exactly what we explained in words before, integrating on a lot of configurations, none of which leads to particle decrease. All of them are particle increases. Automatically cancels out all the terms which are second order. And so you are left with uh, a correction which is only first order. So this means that every time that a particle close to a shock front goes from the upstream to the downstream and upstream again, it gains four thirds of beta times its energy. Well, it seems large, but if you think about it, we're talking about, uh, say, a relativistic pass, say, 1 GV. You know? um, and it's gaining only a fraction which is of order a few percent of its energy. So clearly this means that it takes a lot of going around across the shock because before the energy is actually increased to the energies that we are interested in in cosmic rays. So clearly this is a secular process. It's not something like in a pulsar in which you have the electric field and in one crossing time you can accelerate particles. Here uh, you go through many steps of acceleration, but the good news is, as I said many times, that a uh, particle cannot lose energy. So that's the um, positive side. Um, notice also that Pasquale Serpico bored you to death, I'm kidding, for several hours of diffusion, and I will be boring you 10 times more later with diffusion. Where is diffusion here? Yeah, but all the results that we got so far are all independent on diffusion, right? And even what we will get in five minutes will be completely independent on diffusion. So in the meanwhile, start thinking about where is diffusion coming in. So there are a few things that we need to calculate. So we calculate already a very important quantity, which is the delta E over E per cycle. So we know how much energy the particle gains at every time that it crosses the shock. But of course, a crucial an uh, question that you might uh, uh, ask yourself is, uh, okay, so what if the particle does one cycle and then it's gone? Then what, we, what did we do, right? I mean, it's useless. So we need to calculate the probability that the particle actually stays in the acceleration region. That's the important quantity to evaluate. But also, I want you to think in terms of uh, uh, physics always, not only in mathematics. Imagine again this thing in a reality, in a realistic situation. I told you that this is what we call the downstream, and I also told you that if you're sitting on the shock, then this is the ISM that is coming towards you, and the supernova is down there, right? Somewhere. So the particles scatter on this side, particles scatter on this side, eventually they scatter back on that side, and so on. But imagine now what is happening to the particles which are diffusing. Particles that are diffusing in the upstream they are sitting in a plasma which is actually moving towards the shock, right? So assume for a second the diffusion is so strong, strong, be careful, strong diffusion means the diffusion coefficient is very small, so the particles move very little, right? Uh, so diffusion is so strong that the particles are attached to the fluid. Well, that means that they are forced to be advected with the plasma, right? So if a particle is diffusing with a small diffusion coefficient, the uh, fl uh, the plasma that is moving carries the particle back here. So a, is a very important concept. The particle that is sitting in the upstream, is diffusing upstream, is forced 
to go back to the shock. It's a, it's a matter of time, how long would it take, but it cannot do anything but go back to the shock because it's advected with it. Downstream, the situation is different because downstream, diffusion is trying to take the particles, say, away from the shock or anyway to homogenize the distribution. But the plasma motion, as you see, U2, is going this way. So the particle, particles are, uh, have the trend to be carried away from the shock. So a particle upstream is forced to go back to the shock surface, but the particle downstream is forced to go away. And eventually can, can go back to the shock only because of diffusion. This is of tremendous importance, because if you think about it, you as an observer on Earth, you are sitting down there, not down here. So if you want to see cosmic rays, you have to be creative and make up a, 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 a situation, a, a physics <laughs> Uh, realization that the particles that you accelerated and end up down there, you want them up there. So this is a very important problem. It's called the escape problem, and it's not completely solved yet. People don't, it seems like a paradox, but we know how to accelerate the particles. We don't know how exactly to transform the accelerated particles into cosmic rays. That's why it's important to separate the two. And there is a lot of physics involved in describing how accelerated particles may eventually become cosmic rays. Okay, so keep in mind that there is a, a strong uh, difference between these two things. But let's go back to the exercise here. Uh, there is a lot in what I'm saying that I hope sort of write down at least some notes, because there is no way that I can write these things. So or maybe you can listen to the uh, recording or something. But these are the topics that people work on research-wise, OK? So uh, it, it would be good to keep some memory of all, not only the exercise that you find on textbooks, but also what people are doing to, for a living. Uh, okay, so let's go back to this exercise here, and uh, I want to calculate the return probability. We said that the return probability from upstream is one, right? Particles cannot leave the upstream because they are vectored back to the shock. Is it the same downstream? Well, we already said no, it's not the same downstream, and in fact, uh, let, let's try to calculate what is the probability uh, uh, for the particles to go uh, in the two uh, directions. So the flux of particles, so let's say that F is the distribution function of the particles immediately downstream, okay? Just on this side, right here. Hmm? The, the, the um, velocity of the particles in that place is what? Well. We wrote it before as V mu. Here we have to be slightly more careful about it because, yes, it is V mu, of course, but uh, there is also, uh, so it's V mu, but there, also, there is also the velocity U2. No? For almost all mu's, V mu is larger than U2, but it's important to keep this um, in. So F times V mu plus U2, uh, and the flux of particles that go in the direction, in the downstream, that go in the, in the positive direction, is the integral uh, on mu such that v mu plus u2 is larger than zero. So for simplicity, let me assume that this is the speed of light. It doesn't add anything to the discussion to not have it. So let's say that this is c. Uh, or in units of Pasquale is, is one. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, uh, F times mu plus, mu plus U2 d mu, and uh, the integral is done between minus U2 and one. And this is the flux of particle, let's call it phi out, so the ones that are, uh, I'm sorry, phi in, the ones that are going in the positive direction. The other one, the ones that are going downstream towards the upstream, the same thing, but it's now the integral of f u plus mu2, um, u2 plus mu, but between minus 1 and minus u2. 
So what is the probability for the particles of returning to the shock? Well, it will be exactly the ratio of these two. So it's phi out divided phi in. OK? What you can do is calculate this, which of course depends on uh, u2, and then you take the uh, limit. So this is actually 1 minus u2 squared divided by 1 plus u2 uh, squared. And then you do the limit in which u2 is much le less than unity. And this one becomes 1 minus 4. I reinstalled the c here just to keep in mind that uh, u2 is the velocity with respect to c. So 1 minus 4 u2 over c. What does it mean? Well, again, let's put the velocity of a shock wave for a supernova, for instance, there. That's a few percent. So it means that the probability of returning to the shock for normal shock is, say, 96%, 95, 96. So for typical velocities of a shock, most of the particles actually go back to the shock wave. So it's good news, because you want the particles to go back and back and back many times before it's lost. Um, OK, so now we have two important quantities. One is this return probability. return probability, and the other one is, and the other one is the mean energy gain per cycle. This is now sufficient to finalize the calculation. Why? What do we need to calculate anymore? Well, you always here in our kind of seminars, in your seminars about uh, posters and so on, spectra. So that's what we're interested in. We want to calculate the spectrum of the accelerated particles at this accelerator. And you understand that uh, the spectrum will depend on uh, the energy gain per cycle, so how, many, uh, how much energy you gain every time you cross, but also, what's the probability for the particle to remain in the acceleration region that, rather than getting out of it, right? OK, so in order to do this um, exercise, it's, uh, we'll do it quickly so that we can uh, go back, uh, uh, go and uh, uh, go to more advanced uh, topics. What we can do is the following. So again, introduce a particle which is E0. No? We said that delta E over E is 4 thirds of uh, V over C, right? That means that at the first cycle, you have E1 minus E0 equal to E0 4 thirds uh, V over C, right? Where V is U1 minus U2. And so this means that E1 is equal to uh, E0 times 1 plus 4 thirds of V, right? But this, of course, can be done many times. So the second generation of particles that stay there uh, is uh, E2 equal to E0 times 1 plus 4 thirds of V uh, squared, and so on. So in fact, you have that EK equal to E0 times 1 plus 4 thirds of V to the K, right? However, at the same time, if I assume that I'm injecting N0 particles with an energy E0, now this is how dangerous this statement sounds. If I'm injecting N0, who is it? I mean, I'm not injecting anything. Of course, I'm assuming that the, si that, that the system knows how to select some number of particles from the gas, okay, that is injected, that are injected in the accelerator, but this word injection is a huge problem, understanding how does nature decide that uh, some of the particles get injected. These particles, by the way, are the same, are extracted from the same pool that satisfies the rankine ogonio relationships. But they don't, because if they did, they wouldn't be injected, OK? So uh, how many particles are there? Um, after one cycle, or after two, or after uh, three, and so on. So at the first cycle, n1 is equal to n0 times the probability that they return. 
And at the k cycle, you have nk equal to n0 times p return to the k, right? Therefore, now it's interesting because you see that uh, I'm, I'm going to do something very silly, I mean simple, but ek over e0, uh, take the logarithm of this. This is k logarithm of 1 plus 4 thirds of u, uh, b, right? And I can do this here too, logarithm of nk over n0 equal to k uh, logarithm of return probability. But this is then k logarithm of 1 minus 4u2 over c. Since I'm putting c here, let me put c here too, otherwise you get confused. OK? So I have two independent ways of uh, getting k. And so so from the first, I get that k is the logarithm of ek over e0 over the logarithm of 1 plus 4 thirds of v over c. But this is also the k derived from here, which is the logarithm of nk over n0 divided by the logarithm of 1 minus 4 e2 over c. OK? And now the only thing that is left to do is uh, to expand in the limit of u2 over c much less than 1, because we are dealing with non-relativistic shock waves. And, uh, and there you get the uh, well-known uh, expression that nk over n0 is equal to ek over e0 to some uh, power uh, minus gamma, where gamma here is 3 divided by r minus 1. And this r is the compression factor, u1 over u2. So now what is this n of k, the physical interpretation of it? This is a number of particles. So it is uh, usually when we do our uh, calculations or uh, if you want to compare with data on cosmic rays, what you have is the differential spectrum of cosmic rays. So you want to know how many particles between E and E plus D there is. This is not it, because this is already the number of particles at a given energy. So if you wish, if you want to write this in terms of uh, normal quantities, N of uh, E, let's say that N of E, over, N of e is the differential differential spectrum. This guy there is Ne times E. OK? So Ne times E goes like energy to minus uh, 3 divided by R minus 1. This means that uh, the actual spectrum, the differential spectrum, N of E, goes like this guy minus 1. And this is E to minus 3R over R minus 1. <coughs> OK? Uh, just a second. Minus 1. Yeah, minus yeah. Oh, OK, sorry. This is already in energy, so this is already in energy. So it's uh, R minus 2, OK. Why do I get the wrong result here? Quattro in due, er più in due. Yeah, er più due, yeah. R plus 2 divided by R minus 1, OK? So what happens for a strong shock? For a strong shock, we said that R is 4. And therefore, this one tends to the famous 
e to minus 2. Okay? Now, don't ever say that the spectrum of particles accelerated at shock wave is e to minus 2, because it's not. <laughs> Here we already assumed that, that in order to derive this uh, result, that the particles are relativistic. Okay? But of course, in order to get to relativistic energies, you have to start from thermal. So you have to go through the non-relativistic uh, uh, non regime. And there, the spectrum is not e to minus 2. We'll see in a second what it is. OK? But again, I want you to, uh, again, notice a very important point. Where is the diffusion coefficient here? What do you think? I mean, I got all this, and I assume that diffusion is there only because I want the particles to go back, but none of the results seem to depend, even the spectrum does not seem to depend on the diffusion properties of the medium. No clue? We calculated it. OK. Huh? Well, part, partially, but that's not the main point. But we'll see this uh, in a little bit. But uh, still, until we see the, the, the issue there, it is ex this result basically explains already why this mechanism has become incredibly popular. Because all the microphysics of your problem is in the diffusion coefficient, which usually you don't know. I mean, you don't measure directly. You have no way to actually measure directly the diffusion coefficient. And so you can do all this phenomenolo phenomenology without knowing anything about the microphysics. And the result is very weakly dependent on that, at least to this level. OK? Um, OK. Now, let's become serious. Can I raise here? Well, of course, you remember the spectrum, so we don't need to keep it. OK? Now, finally, let's try to find a connection between diffusion and uh, this problem. The situation that we have in mind is this one. And we know that particles are diffusing, and actually, uh, that is the essential uh, reason why the particles go back to the shock. Therefore, this is the perfect example, a perfect case, in which we can apply the transport equation that uh, Pasquale Serpico derived yesterday, no, maybe before, the uh, day before yesterday, okay, and apply it to this system. Let's see what the equation is telling us. Uh, before doing that, maybe, maybe, I don't know, uh, let's, let's see. It might be useful to remember just to recall just a very, uh, very few uh, results that Pasquale uh, derived. So the point that um, he tried to make, to make is that uh, if you have a charged particle in the presence of a uh, background of alpha end waves, the particles diffuse a momentum uh, diffusion pitch angle, right? And as a consequence of the diffusion in pitch angle, they also diffuse in space, right? And this is showed very elegantly. Um, let me rewrite a few essential results. One was what he called the d mu mu, which is defined as one half of delta mu delta mu over delta t. And uh, the expression that you can write is uh, Q delta B over MC 
gamma squared, 1 minus mu squared, 1 over 2b mu delta of k plus or minus, minus plus omega over v mu. It's a rewriting of what he did. For an individual particle with an individual k. I wrote it this way because I want to remind you again that the diffusion process is an intrinsically resonant process. So you must have waves which have exactly the right wave number so that the particle diffuses in pitch angle. And the right wave number k is 1 over the Larmor radius of the particles. Okay? So if there is power available on a scale which is of the order of the Larmor radius of the particles, then the particles will scatter. Also, um, he told you that in general, in the interstellar medium or in any environment, you don't have power only on one scale. You have a power spectrum, as we call it, right? And if you have a power spectrum, let's call it uh, f of k, hmm? this f of k, let's say, let's define it as the delta b squared over b0 squared at the wave number k, okay? And you can, of course, integrate the diffusion coefficient on the power spectrum, and the integral becomes trivial because of the delta function, right? So in the end, you remember that he writes, he wrote an expression like this for a genetic spectrum of turbulence, saying that this delta b squared was, in fact, the delta b squared at the wave number k, right? The power spread, this, this f. And also he calculated the diffusion coefficient in uh, space as a function of that. And it's very interesting because you can rewrite that as one-third of the Larmor radius times the velocity of the particles times 1 over f of k calculated at the k resonance. Okay? You can look back at the formula and you will find this. So the diffusion coefficient in space is actually inversely proportional, this is a point that he made, to the power spectrum. The more power spectrum, the more power there is in the spectrum, the smaller is the diffusion coefficient. So diffusion is very effective. The less power there is, particles go more like straight, and therefore the diffusion coefficient is large. Now, look at, let me rewrite this in a little bit different way. Uh, in the first lecture, he introduced the concept of uh, path length. You can always write the diffusion coefficient as one third of V times lambda, where lambda is the path length. It doesn't matter whether you're describing a drop of ink in the water, or maybe you're describing perfume coming out of a, of a bottle. Uh, anything, you know? You can always write that. Of course, the physics is in what is lambda, what is the path length. But you can see immediately from here that the path length lambda for a diffusion uh, of this type is simply RL divided by F. Okay? So the path length is also inversely proportional to the spectrum. So I'm writing this only because uh, it is, uh, I guess, I hope, clear that when you deal with diffusion in space and you want to make diffusion coefficient small enough, you have to pump energy into the turbulence. If you have enough turbulence, then diffusion coefficient is small. Why do you want diffusion coefficient to be small? We'll be clear in a second. Now, let's go back to another result that Pasquale derived for, uh, for us. Namely, the transport equation. Transport equation can be written in uh, this way here. How did I call the coordinate z?
This is the one-dimensional version of the equation that, is, that he derived, uh, with one simplification that I threw out the second order acceleration that uh, it, you remember that DPP, I threw it out because we now feel comfortable saying that it's second order, so we don't care, right? What is F? F is the function of Z, P, and in principle time, and it's defined as, uh, I repeat what you already said, as a distribution function in phase space. So that means that if you want to know the number of particles between P and P plus dP, this is 4 pi P square F of P dP. Okay? So the momentum, the element of volume in momentum space is this guy. So if you want this, you have to calculate 4 pi p squared dp. Uh, in this uh, equation, I want to make additional simplifications. One simplification I want to make is that I want to assume that the system reaches some sort of stationarity. And so I want to calculate the solution in which this term is not, uh, is not there. Moreover, I want to apply this system to this guy here. So I want to specialize that equation to this situation here. What is that I have to do? Well, uh, this means that uh, the, uh, in the upstream, this will be u1, this will be u1, and in the downstream, this will be u2, right? And also, at the shock, the velocity changes in a uh, discontinuous uh, manner, which means that the du in dz is equal to zero everywhere, really, right? It's zero everywhere, but the jump is u1 minus u2 at the shock. Therefore, I can simply write this du in dz as u2 minus u1 delta of z. u2 minus u1 because the order, the axis is directed this way. So u2 minus u1 delta of z, right? Uh, this term Q, you didn't have this term there, but you need one because this is a linear equation, which means that in order to have something in the end, you have to inject it. So that term is the injection term. Now, notice, please, that this equation cannot possibly be applied to the thermal particles. This equation was derived assuming that the particles behave uh, according with diffusion and so on. So it cannot describe, this equation does not contain the rankine ugonio relations. So already conceptually, you are making a strong distinction between what you are calling thermal particles and what you are calling cosmic rays. And you are putting that by hand. Nature doesn't do that, doesn't, doesn't behave that way. Nature has a plasma, which is made of a bunch of stuff and uh, somehow decide, so you get accelerated, you don't. So that's the problem of injection, and we are hiding this problem in this function Q here, okay? What else? Uh, yeah, that's all, I guess. Oh, there is one other thing. Uh, the particles, we said that the plasma behaves according with the rankine ugonio relations, which means that there is a jump in velocity, for instance, at the shock. The density also jumps exactly by the same amount, right? The compression factor. What about the cosmic rays? Okay, so the accelerated particles, this is sort of a definition in a sense, are the ones that don't feel the discontinuity because they are clearly already separated by the, by the thermal, from the thermal particles. And this is the very important point in which the concept of collisionless shocks comes again into the game. Collisionless shocks are the ones, as we said, that are that develop because of uh, electromagnetic dissipation on very small scales. What is that scale? It's roughly the Larmor radius of the thermal particles. Here, these particles that we're dealing with have a Larmor radius which is gigantic compared with, compared with the Larmor radius of the thermal particles. Therefore, the, cosm the accelerated particles, namely the one described by this F, cannot know that the shock is there. They know it through the velocities that they feel, u1 and u2, but f per se is continuous. So f 
does not feel the discontinuity between one and two because the particle just goes through. Of course, it feels that the plasma under its feet is moving with a different velocity, and we will see how. But per se, F is continuous across the shock, right? It is like having a stairs, but you are able, your step is uh, like 10 times the size of your stairs. Well, then you don't know that the stairs are there, OK? So F is continuous. OK, so let's see what happens uh, if I consider this equation upstream. Upstream is this guy here. So in the upstream, this equation, uh, I'm sorry, this is G, sorry. You didn't correct me. U, D, F, in D, G, OK? So in the upstream, this term is 0. And uh, we will assume that the injection appears, happens only at the shock surface. Okay, so that the particles are kicked in the system only at the shock. So this means that this is proportional uh, to delta of G. And we will also assume that the injection happens at a specific momentum that we'll call uh, P injection. That means that if I write this equation in the upstream, in the upstream, the equation simply reads D, DF in the Z minus U F D in D Z equals zero. Right? Yes? I simply collected uh, these two terms here. Which of course means that uh, D uh, D F in D Z minus U F is constant upstream. But if this is the case, of course, upstream infinity, which is where you are, all these quantities are zero, right? Because there are no particles that got upstream infinity. Therefore, both of, uh, therefore this constant must be zero. Right? Yes? No? Wake up. Could you repeat? Yes. So if... Uh, I am sitting in the upstream frame, so z less than 0. This term is not there. This term is not there. I collect these two terms, and I have d in dz, d df in dz minus uf equals 0, which means that this quantity is constant. What is this constant? Well, I can calculate it wherever I want, right? So I calculate it at infinity. But at infinity, I have 0 both in df in dz and f. Both of them are 0. Therefore, the quantity must be 0. But this means that at the shock, d the f in the z at z equals 0 minus, which is here, no, is u1 f0, where f0 is f calculated at z equals 0. Right? OK, so what about the downstream? Well, in the downstream, uh, the situation is uh, uh, very, very similar. But here is a bit of a tricky point, because the downstream, in principle, can be infinite. And if the system is stationary, then F can only be constant. Because if it was not constant, it would be blowing up, right? So in the end, the F in the Z downstream is bound to be 0. It's the only way that you can have a stationary solution. So in the downstream, the only thing that I care is that d, df in dz in 0 plus is 0. Namely, the distribution function is homogeneous. This can be shown in a more formal way, but we don't have time to do that uh, here. If you want, you can come and ask questions uh, later on. Okay, we are left only with one thing. We integrated in the downstream, we integrated in the upstream, and now we integrated at the shock. So what happens if I take this equation here and I integrate that between 0 minus and 0 plus? Well, what is the integral of this quantity between 0 minus and 0 plus? The UDF in DZ. 
Come on, you have 10 seconds to answer. Four. <laughs> Zero. I told you, F is continuous. It's zero. Even if u is non-zero, you, you can try to integrate by parts, but the two terms will have to go away, right? So first term is zero. So I have zero. And then the second term, of course, is uh, d df in dz, zero plus, minus d df in dz in uh, zero minus. Then I have this guy here, which integrated between upstream and uh, downstream is plus one third of u2 minus u1 p d f0 in dp plus plus the injection term, which of course is non-zero because I'm assuming that uh, particles are being injected at uh, z equals zero. Um, Yeah, well, anyway, uh, I, hope, uh, I was hoping of having a physics normalization here, but let's just say that this is uh, proportional to Q0 and delta of P minus P injection. Okay? Okay, now, this guy, we said it's zero. This guy. Hmm? And this guy here, we said it's u1 f0. So I put this on the other side, and I have u1 f0 plus uh, equal to one third. Let me put minus one third, u1 minus u2. So I'm changing the sign of this, p df0 in dp. Right? Yes? OK, so for P different from P injection, this term is not there. So I can use this simply as a boundary condition, as a normalization, right? So I have this equation here. What is that? Clue? Yeah. So it's yeah. So it's a power law with a slope, which is uh, so it's uh, f zero of p is proportional to p to minus three u one divided by u one minus u two. Right. But here I can introduce the compression factor, right? So u1 over u2 is the compression factor. So for instance, let's divide this by u2. This is minus 3r divided by r minus 1, right? Where r, again, is u1 divided by u2. So f of p behaves as a power law with index minus 3r over r minus 1. Notice that this is different from the one we found before. Why? Because this f is f in phase space. Before, we calculated the f in energy space. So let's do the actual thing. So n of p dp is 4 pi p square f of p dp. So n of p is proportional to p square times this guy. So p to minus 3 r over r minus 1. Namely, the slope is 2 
r minus 2 minus 3 r divided by r minus 1. And this is again minus r plus 2 divided by r minus 1, which is the one we found before. But notice, this is p. And p is energy only in the relativistic regime. In the non-relativistic regime, the spectrum is not e to minus 2. And in fact, if you calculate what it is, for a strong shock, it's e to minus 2 at high energy, high by, I mean, larger than the mass. But in the non-relativistic regime, it's e to minus 3 halves. So it's not, the spectrum of particle accelerator at the shock is not e to minus 2. It's p to minus 4. And then whatever p is, you know, you, you, you get the right thing. But it's important, especially when you deal with non-relativistic particles, it is important. It doesn't matter whether you have, uh, so for instance, in a, in a jet of material that is moving with Lorentz factor gamma with respect to you, if the particles are non-relativistic in the reference frame of the jet, you have to remember that the spectrum is not e to minus 2, it's p to minus 4. Okay? This is extremely important also in the galaxy, because the Voyager, for instance, measures the spectrum at energies which are MeV, or 10 MeV or so. And there, you have to account for A, the fact that the injection, that the spectrum accelerator particles is not e to minus 2, but B, you have to take into account the energy losses that uh, Pasquale Serpico is discussing in his lecture, lectures. Okay, we got to a good point. Now I just need to go back to the issue of the diffusion coefficient. So even now, we solved the diffusion equation, and the freaking diffusion coefficient left the game. It's nowhere. Right? So where is that, that this thing enters? Well, it enters because there are the reason why you get power laws is because there is no scale in this problem, right? The power law doesn't have any scale. But you want a scale there, because your system, for instance, has a finite size or a finite age. And moreover, you want uh, the process to be, the process of acceleration, to be as fast as possible, because you want to accelerate to high energies, right? And what dictates the time scales of the problem is d. So all this is true, provided the particles get accelerated. But how long does that take? That's where the diffusion coefficient enters the game. There are many ways of addressing this issue. Most of the ways to address this issue take a couple of days, so I cannot do that. But there is an easy way to have a feeling of what is going on. So if you are upstream, no? If you are upstream, again, for those of you that are not used, upstream is sitting in the reference frame of the shock is where the interstellar medium is, okay? I told you that is a sort of a critical place to be because if, imagine really of being sitting on the shock and the ISM is coming towards you. In principle, it should only have the level of turbulence that was there in the very, you know, to start with because the shock didn't get there yet, right? So if you wish, the upstream is the region where it is um, somehow more delicate, more, more difficult to find the turbulence that you need in order to be accelerated. At least this might seem so naively, right? So the acceleration time, as we call it, how long it takes for accelerating the particles, will depend mostly on the upstream, on how quickly. We said that it is guaranteed that you come back from the upstream. But we don't know whether it takes 10 to minus 3 seconds or 10 to 3 years. For doing that, we need a diffusion coefficient, right? So the acceleration time is dominated, really, by what happens to a particle of momentum p in the upstream. What is a particle doing in the upstream? Well, it's trying to diffuse. And Pasquale told you that the diffusion length is proportional to the square root of t. So how far in a time t a particle you know, is 
uh, bound to go is square root of 4 dt, right? But at the same time, the particle is attached to the magnetic field lines which are being advected, swept away with the plasma. The plasma is moving at velocity u1, right? So in a way, the particle is leaving at 4 dt, but the plasma is moving in the same time by u1t. So you have two uh, opposing trends. The particle is trying to leave, but the plasma is pushing it back. And so the, uh, how far it can move is basically the place where these two are the same, are equal. And if you square this, you have 4dt uh, equal to u1 squared t squared. So I do this, and the time t is of order d over u1 squared. I'm sorry, this 4 is not there in the one dimension, so square root of dt. I'm sorry. In the three dimension, is, uh, is a 4. So t is d over u1 squared, right? So you immediately understand that if you want the particle to be accelerated quickly, you want t to be as small as possible. So d, the diffusion coefficient, must be as small as possible. d small as possible, you remember I wrote down here and then I erased that d is one third of uh, v rl over f. RL is calculated in the magnetic field B0, so in the unperturbed field. So the only thing that you can change to make D as small as possible is this F, this power spectrum. So you need to push power in the environment. You have turbulence, you have alpha end waves, a lot of them, so that you decrease D and you can make D, uh, the acceleration time T as small as possible. So that's the game that you want to play. If you want to accelerate to higher and higher energy, you want this to be as small as possible. How does this scale with energy? Let's see. Well, this is basically C, right? This is basically the speed of light. RL is linear in energy, right? Okay, so uh, RL is proportional to energy. What about F? This F of K typically has um, a dependence of the type K to minus power, some power alpha. But you remember that K is calculated at the resonance. So it's calculated at one over the Larmor radius. So in the end, this is proportional to the Larmor radius to the alpha which is energy to the alpha. So you see immediately from here that the diffusion coefficient is bound to be a growing function of energy. So already from here you see that in order to make this small, it's going to be harder and harder when the energy increases. Okay. So if you want to accelerate to very high energy, you have to push a lot of power into uh, the alpha end waves, otherwise you don't scatter uh, fast enough. Namely, this one is not small enough. Small enough compared with what? Well, of course, how much, how long you have in your system, the age of the system, for instance. And here it becomes a little tricky, because usually in sources that we know, like supernova, for instance, this U1 also scales with time. For instance, it slows down in the set of Taylor phase, right? So there, is different, there are different things that depend on time, and you have to combine the effect of all these things. We will see this tomorrow, okay? But the essential physics is what I just told you. Um, okay, now, I hope I convinced you that we get the same results with the very simple statistical approach and with the formal solution of the transport equation. It seems to me a very elegant exercise. So it's nice. We got the same result. That's good. Now let's start to see if there are any weak points. As a theorist, that's what you do. You build a theory and then you try to destroy it to see how solid it is, right? 
OK, so first thing that you can do, uh, this first thing we will see it uh, tomorrow in a little more detail, much more detail, but just uh, as an order of magnitude, intuitive thing. Do you have any idea how long is the, I mean, when in a supernova, typical supernova, I don't care about the exact number, but how, uh, how, how much time after the explosion of the supernova you enter the set of Taylor phase? Do you know? Well, it depends on the type of supernova, of course, but typically it's between a few hundred years for a supernova type one to maybe a bit less than 100 years for a supernova type two uh, in the wind of uh, the giant, but this is all details. But it's order 100 years, let's say, okay? Just to have a, a number in, in the hands. Also, tomorrow, Pasquale Serpico will show you, you remember he, I discussed in the first class, in the first lecture, about boron over carbon, the grammage, and blah, blah, blah. You remember? And I told you that uh, the boron over carbon and the decay of unstable isotopes like beryllium is the main indicator to know how long the cosmic rays stay in the galaxy, right? And that, of course, is a measure of the diffusion coefficient indirectly. And uh, probably Pasquale will show you that the diffusion coefficient that seems to be in rough agreement with what we see in the galaxy is of the order of uh, 3 times 10 to 28 centimeters square per second times an energy measured in GeV to about a, a third, a half. It doesn't matter. Let's say that it's a, a third. Uh, this slope is a little uncertain because of many, many reasons. But this will probably be discussed by Pasquale. I don't know. Well, U1, provided you are in the be begin, up to the beginning of the set of Taylor phase, is of the order of the velocity with which the supernova exploded. So it's about 10,000 kilometers uh, per second, right? Therefore, you can put this number inside here. So you can say U1 is of order a few thousand, say 5,000 kilometers per second. The diffusion coefficient is this one with this energy dependence. Try to make, make that exercise. And you will see that if you impose that this is of order the beginning of the set of Taylor phase, you will get energy of order GV, <laughs> maybe 10 GV. You, can, you might say, oh, okay, why don't we go to a later time? It doesn't help because at that point the velocity goes down and the maximum energy drops. So the bottom line is we invented a beautiful machine, but if the level of turbulence, I'm calling improperly this F of K turbulence. It's not a proper word, but let's call it like that. The level of turbulence in the upstream is the same as I would have in the galaxy as deduced from boron over carbon or from beryllium. The maximum energy is way far from maximum energy that we observe in cosmic rays like the knee or anything close to the knee, in fact. Okay? So this is a first indication that you need something more than what we did, something more than what we did in order to make this um, F of K in the diffusion coefficient much larger than it is in the interstellar medium. And we will show tomorrow that the most plausible reason why this happens is because the particles that are being accelerated produce their own turbulence. So. Of course, this problem, when you do that, becomes immediately nonlinear, right? Because the diffusion coefficient that you want to use in that equation depends on f. And this is the definition of a nonlinearity, right? It's like writing this as the derivative uh, respect to z of a function of f times df indeed z. You are gone. You're fried. It's a nonlinear problem. It becomes a lot more complicated. But there are lots of things that you can do. So first complication that leads to the conclusion that you need some generalization of what we did to include some nonlinear effects is the fact that I want f much larger than in the galaxy. So this points towards some nonlinear effects. 
second issue that I want to point out. Let's say that we got everything right and that the spectrum of the particles that we got is, uh, has any resemblance with the stuff that we observe, which it does, right? I mean, we observe, uh, do you know what's the spectrum that we observe? And the answer to this question must be yes, we know. What is it? At low energy. Low, namely, below the knee. 2 point what? 2.7. This is 2. Do you know what the difference comes from? Huh? No. Fortunately not. But Pasquale will tell you tomorrow, it comes from transport in the galaxy. So the transport in the galaxy is also energy dependent. The diffusion in the galaxy is energy dependent. So the difference between the two and, uh, and what you observe is in this number here, or something connected to that. So two is not too far from what we wanted it to be. So that's great result. But let's see what strange thing happens here. Let's really focus on uh, relativistic particles, okay? So for now, I'm going to ignore the difference between e to minus two and something else, because we are dealing with relativistic particles. Well, what is the energy in the form of cosmic rays that is contained in this uh, box that I invented? Well, it's integral in the E of E to minus two, well, proportional to, no? E to minus two times the energy. And I'm going to integrate this, say, from the mass of the particles up to whatever. Shut that thing off. <laughs> so what is this? Well, this is <laughs> diverging, right? Well, of course, you can say, well, yeah, but maybe here it's not infinity. It's some E max. Yes, so this is the logarithm of E max times E zero. But that number how does it compare with how much energy I have in my box? How much energy can I possibly transform into cosmic rays in this box? I'm, tell, I'm told you that you can extract only energy from the thermal plasma. That's what you have. You have nothing else. And magnetic field, but usually magnetic fields are small. So the only energy that you can transform is rho u squared. But if this number, even if it doesn't diverge, becomes comparable with rho u squared, the test particle assumption that you made in the very beginning is wrong. And you remember yesterday we saw the equation of uh, conservation of momentum, no? In which I have minus nabla pressure on the right side. That's what's going to happen, that I cannot neglect the pressure of cosmic rays. But again, this is a nonlinear problem. And again, the fact that E max can lead to too much energy nonlinearity non again right so clearly the this problem is suggesting that if really i get this result then i have to generalize the problem to a sort of a, a nonlinear version of the theory that i uh, constructed that i built that i built um, there was another thing that I wanted to tell you. Let's see what it was. Uh, well, okay, so at least we have these two down. And uh, it's more than enough motivation to know that the theory we developed is uh, beautiful in terms of being sufficiently close to what we observe that we can feel satisfied about it. But at the same time, we know that it requires some addition, some modification, so that we can actually compare it uh, with actual data, with actual uh, physical applications, OK? So I'll stop here for now and take questions.
Hi. Uh, what did you do with, uh, with the injection? Uh, I understood that you... Oh, right. Yeah, so I, I, I told you that... Um, I erased it, but okay. So, but what I did is uh, to use it as a normalization. So here I only said uh, proportional to proportional to. Ah, okay. The number that is in front of here is uh, the injection term. Okay, thank. So typically, just to give you an idea, um, uh, typically the fraction of the flock, uh, the, the the fraction of particles that cross the shock, that refuse to thermalize and become uh, accelerated particles is of the order of 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5. So one particle out of 100,000 becomes cosmic rays. But the energy that they carry can be easily comparable with the rho u squared. That's why this effect is prob potentially problematic. I will take a question for someone who has never asked a question before. I never asked, so I will ask one. So uh, one thing that I want to stress once more is we never uh, specialized this so far to any source. So this is equally good for any type of shockwave, provided it's non-relativistic. There are, of course, complications in the case in which the shock is relativistic, for instance, for gamma ray bursts and so on. I will, if I find time, I will say a few words some more about this. But, I hope that you appreciate the generality of this sort of lines of arguments. All the considerations that we made so far, with the exception of some numerics for the maximum energy, apply really to whatever class of sources in which there is a shock. So you can apply it to the solar wind shock, the termination shock of the wind of the solar wind, or you can apply it to supernova remnants, or you can apply it to an accretion shock around a compact source, or you can apply it uh, uh, to clusters of galaxies, and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter. I mean, the conclusions are absolutely uh, go on the same lines of reasoning. seems to be practically universal, the results you got. And in the limit of very large Mach numbers, this is actually universal. So the spectrum you get does not depend on the thermodynamical properties of your, of your system, which a priori is, is, is kind of magic, right? Uh, you have no uh, influence of the, I don't know, the temperature there or uh, uh, whatnot. It's just this, this ratio that determines the Thanks. Um, I remembered what I had to tell you before, so maybe I can just add one piece of uh, a bit. We, you remember I told you that we assume stationarity in a problem, right? Now, uh, does this make sense? Okay, so if I assume stationarity, it means that I have a maximum momentum. But also means that the system cannot change, right? But the system is infinite on one side, it's infinite on the other side, and if I have a P max at a given time, I must have a higher momentum at a later time. So the system clearly cannot be stationary. So the assumption of stationarity automatically carries with it the hidden assumption that P max is infinite. But if P max is infinite, this number diverts, and if this number diverts, the theory. So clearly, there is uh, more than this. This what, what I just illustrated today is the so-called test particle theory. There is clearly more than this, and we will find out what it is uh, tomorrow. OK. Uh, we are two questions away from the coffee break. <laughs> Someone had never asked a question before. Where is the list? <laughs> Huh? 
44. Where is 44? Yeah, generator of number, really random. It's a quantum generator of number. 44 is Pasquale Dario Sef. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Should no, I? No, no, ask questions. OK. No other curiosity, seriously? She has a curiosity. Well, it's not a curiosity, it's just that uh, I think I didn't follow pretty well when you uh, developed this proportionality of uh, F. Uh, this one? With the, yeah, with, mm. the, with the index and everything. So now the, the diffuse coefficient is supposed to be proportional to energy or inverse proportional to the energy. Because OK, so yeah, no, OK. So maybe there is a sign problem. That's what you are saying, right? Yeah, minus alpha. But okay. alpha is always, so let me make an example which is more practical. People always say Kolmogorov spectrum. You must have heard Kolmogorov, the word Kolmogorov spectrum. It doesn't mean much, but say Kolmogorov spectrum. Kolmogorov doesn't really apply to magnetic turbulence. It's fluid turbulence. But uh, for the case of uh, 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 Kolmogorov, F of K is K to minus 2 thirds, OK? The five thirds that you must have heard somewhere is, uh, so this f of k is k times the power spectrum. So five, minus five thirds plus one is minus two thirds. So for a Kolmogorov, f of k is k to minus uh, two thirds, which means that um, this is Larmé radius to two thirds. And in that case, the diffusion coefficient goes like our Larmé radius to one minus two thirds which is this one third, OK? That's how the work, the game, the game works. You must have heard also about so-called bomb diffusion, right? Bomb diffusion, anybody? What is it? Huh? Bomb diffusion. Who, is, who knows what bomb diffusion is? But what is it? How do you write it? It's this guy, right? So you see that bomb diffusion corresponds to having the same power on all scales. So f is constant. If f is constant and it's 1, then you get bomb diffusion. So bomb basically corresponds to a situation in which you have the same power on all the scales. We'll see, probably we'll see tomorrow, that uh, if the spectrum of uh, accelerated particles is p to minus 4, the spectrum of turbulence that they produce is scale invariant. And so that's exactly why you get usually bomb diffusion in these situations. Any other question? Yes. You have asked questions. Well, I, I think uh, my question is a basic one, but uh, I, I was wondering, uh, you said that cosmic rays are uh, usually positively charged. So um, I, I, uh, to myself, I understand that cosmic rays may reach the, uh, our, our atmosphere and probably on Earth. So if they can reach Earth, and that uh, our Earth is magnet, uh, I mean, is a, it has a magnetic, magnetic field, and uh, that cosmic rays may be uh, electromagnetic wave. So how comes they uh, we can we, we are able to detect cosmic rays on the on the ground? Is it possible to detect on to the, detect them? I mean, on, on the Earth. On the Earth. Yeah. Is it possible to detect them? Cosmic rays? Yes. Fortunately, yes. Otherwise, 95% of you will find no jobs. In, in <laughs> <laughs> so if, if <laughs> which might be. So I was, wonder, I was thinking that maybe there will be uh, some deviation, because we have, elect I mean, we have magnetic fields due to the Earth, and we also have uh, charge, electric charges uh, coming with uh, cosmic rays. 
Well, you just invented for yourself an exercise <laughs> in which you compare the Larmor radius, RL, which is uh, M uh, V gamma over uh, times C divided by E B of the Earth in this case. Okay, and compare this with the size of the Earth and find what's the energy for which this is important. You will find out that we are safe. We can detect cosmic rays at the Earth, unless you are, of course, at very low energy. And you remember in the first uh, lecture, um, I discussed about the east-west effect, which is a variation in the flux depending on direction. That mechanism, uh, depending on charge, sorry, um, and that effect is associated with the fact that uh, for low energy particles, the Larmor radius is smaller than the size of the Earth. So you see that if the particle is positively charged, they mainly come from one direction. If they're negatively charged, they mainly come from the other direction. So yes, you do see that effect. Of course, when you go to sufficiently large energy, because of the fact that this scales linearly with the Lorentz factor, the Larmor radius becomes much larger. In the interstellar medium, the Larmor radius of a particle at 1 GeV is about one third of the size of the solar system, okay, at 1 GeV. So you easily understand that we're talking about large scales. Actually, this problem was solved at the beginning of 20th century by Sturmer, a Norwegian mm -hmm. uh, astrophysicist. Uh, I invite you to, to read the original papers. Uh, they can be found on ADS uh, database. And it's amazing how he hired, there was a great uh, statement, I hired two new P uh, PhD students. We managed to compute 12 orbits by hand, of course, in this kind of uh, uh, potential because he was interested in knowing what are the, you know, uh, there are sort of blind zones uh, from which you cannot get uh, cosmic rays. And the practical application of this problem that you mentioned is, for instance, in super K, uh, because there is a sort of penumbra and the flux of cosmic rays that you get in different locations of the Earth at, as a function of energy depends exactly on how many trajectories are forbidden because of this effect. And so it's still of actual application in uh, current experiments uh, solving this type it's of It's not an easy problem to solve. In fact, uh, but when Bruno Rossi proposed this uh, east-west effect, he had several technical problems in uh, solving the equation. And there is record of an interesting conversation he had with Enrico Fermi on this topic. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's complicated by the morphology of the magnetic field of the of the, the topology of the magnetic field of the, of the Earth. Um, but the second part of your question, namely they are positively charged and they move around in a galaxy, is actually a good consideration because, um, well, of course, as Pasquale Serpico told you, and we used the, this information in the downstream, the particles are easily isotropized by diffusion, which means that you have an equal number of charges moving in both ways, but not exactly. So the two don't compensate exactly in the galaxy, for instance, and this means that you have a current. And you have a current means that you have uh, an additional term in the Maxwell equations, which goes you know, to actually have uh, many implications, like exciting instabilities. One question that nobody asked me or you is, we told you, I mean, I told you in the first lecture that the galactic, the galactic medium is magnetized is a magnetic field. Actually, all of the astrophysical systems that we know about are, if we can measure them, they are magnetized. So these magnetic fields should come from somewhere, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, currents uh, obviously uh, must be involved, and there are there is an old other branch of uh, plasma astrophysics yeah. uh, associated to the theory of uh, magnetogenesis or magnetodynamics. Yeah. Okay, we can thank Pasquale again. I would like to get the form with the signatures back here, and uh, wh whoever is holding it. And uh, it's time for coffee. But do me a favor, get some more coffee in the morning, okay? <laughs> That's for free in the hotel.
Who has the signature paper? That was somewhere over there. No? 